Good afternoon. My name is Mariah Billups, and I am pleased to welcome you to What's Up Doc, a monthly lecture program brought to you by the Concord Hospital Trust. Concord Hospital Trust would like to recognize and thank the Walker Lecture Series for their generous sponsorship of What's Up Doc. The Lecture Walker, Walker Lecture Series offers a wide variety of programs on history, literature, art, and science, as well as dramatic, musical, and literary performances. All events are free to the public and held at the Concord City Auditorium. We encourage you to check out their website at walkerlecture.org to view their calendar of programs. What's Up Doc is proud to welcome Dr. David Nagel of Concord Orthopedics as our guest physician today. Dr. Nagel is a physical medicine and rehabilitation provider who for the past 33 years has specialized in pain management. His special interests include doctor-patient communication and advocacy and social justice for those who suffer from chronic pain. He is the author of the book, Needless Suffering, How Society Fails Those with Chronic Pain, described as a self-help book for society with the potential to change the way we talk about pain in America. Needless Suffering offers a broad sociological look at how we, as a culture, treat those who suffer too often needlessly and how through public policy and personal behavior we can do much better. Dr. Nagel currently serves as a state representative in New Hampshire House of Representatives, where he serves on multiple committees with the primary focus on access to care, access to pain care, access to alternative therapies, and access to care for those affected by disparities due to disability, gender, race, and or ethnicity. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nagel. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Wow, I don't have anything else to talk about. That was my whole talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of on a Lenten mi ver uh, mission right now. I um, just returned from skiing in Purgatory, of all places. And I, I find it strange. I talk all over the country, but I'd never talked in Concord before. And um, so this is kind of returning to Nazareth. And, and like Jesus going to Nazareth, I guarantee you there will be no miracles today. So um, this, the, the way this, this whole talk originated was... Um, Earlier this year, I'd been approached by the U.S. Pain Foundation that I've worked with for a while on putting a talk together, like, is there a way to prevent chronic pain? And um, is there anybody in the room that has, we already know somebody has pain. Is any other, and I know other people have already mentioned to me that they have pain, but anybody else ever have pain in their life? Ever? <laughs> yeah, if you, if you say no, um, I, I worry about you. Um, <laughs> I mean, it does happen, but like, um, you know, the, 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 the big question was, well, we know people have pain. Um, one of the interesting things is that the fact that we're willing to talk about pain is more than they're willing to talk do at most med schools. So you are now ahead of most med schools by being here because they don't talk about pain there, which is a huge problem. But um, anyways, they wanted to talk about that transition. And the reason why they wanted me to do it was um, um, I work put it this way, the outcome of that discussion is at the website below there, which I guess will be online and I can get that to you. Um, but the, uh, the link above that actually is a project that I've worked with the NFL Players Association on where we've actually talked about this issue, like how do you ruin your body for so many years and then have a meaningful life after. So the strategies that we're going to talk about are the same strategies that we developed there. So I know most of you don't look like NFL players, but as we go on, I'm going to be explaining to you why you are like NFL players. So what we're going to talk about over the next 45 minutes or so is what causes acute pain, how do you treat it, um, what is chronic pain, and what are the best approaches, um, and what's the intersection between the two. Can you prevent it? And I'm going to give you some thoughts about that. I, I guarantee you there's nothing in the literature that's going to guide us on that that much. Um, and what about those living with chronic pain, um, also dealing with an acute issue, what's different about that? And how do you interact with the healthcare system in doing all that? So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, before we get into that, I think it's really important for me to share with you who I am and why I do what I do. Um, um, that's my mom, me, and my dad on the end. I, my mom's part of every presentation I give. Um, <laughs> That's not me. That's Gene Wilder, but that's Gene Wilder living out of my fantasy, which is me standing next to Terry Garr, who I think is adorable. Not so much Marty Feldman. And that's my book. So um, years ago when I was a kid, I started working with older folks and um, very active uh, elderly people. 
And I was with them long enough to watch their functional decline, and I got really interested in function at end of life. Like, how do you promote that? How do you help people preserve what's meaningful to them? Um, not just at the end of life, because I work with a lot of kids with disabilities and things like that, but um, I just watched friends become disabled, and, and I didn't think that should be at the end of life. I thought it should be a way to help them keep going. So I wanted to do that, follow that either as an entrepreneur through a business or as a physical therapist. My father told me I wanted to be a doctor. My dad was always right, so I became a doctor. <laughs> um, so I went into physical medicine and rehabilitation, and, and I went to one of the best med schools in the United States for teaching doctor-patient communication. That was the University of Rochester. And through my experiences at U of R and, um, and then in physical medicine rehab residency, I was dealing with people with all sorts of disabilities and what struck me, and even as I came into practice first at Easter Seals here in New Hampshire and then at Concord Ortho, I was just absolutely amazed that pain was part of every disability I ever saw, but nobody ever really paid much attention to it. They had this weird idea that if you treat the underlying problem, it'll all go away that if it doesn't go away, it's all in your head, you're fat, you're old, whatever. I mean, you know, they came up with all these wonderful explanations for why you still have pain. And I found all of that to be not tremendously helpful. I was extremely concerned about that, and I decided that I needed to do something about that. So um, I started getting involved in policy development in the early 90s, basically helping people at end of life get access to opioids um, and then using opioids in a socially responsible manner. So we wrote all the social public policy on opioids in the late 90s and I've been involved in that ever since. But I became really impressed that most of my, I, I, you probably aren't aware of this, but most of your lives are not in a doctor's office. Is anybody else aware of that? I mean, and I just got really interested in the world outside my office, and that's why I got involved with all these things. Um, my mom was my inspiration. She was severely disabled by rheumatoid arthritis. All our lives growing up, I never saw her pain. And I, I went, how many people around you were in pain? Uh, don't have this, have this idea that people around you are not aware of your level of dysfunction, suffering, whatever. I mean, it's something to think about. But I lived with my mom for years, and until I had that um, realization that pain was a part of disability, I never even saw her pain, and I thought that was strange. But fortunately, my dad did, and that's an important example that we're gonna talk about through this whole talk, is the importance of an advocate. We know in rehabilitation medicine that people that have a good support system do best. People that don't, don't. It's that simple. And my dad was always there for my mom. Um, I, I ended up creating, uh, with a bunch of other people here in Concord, a, a model of care that we still think is the best model of care in the country. And that's a community-based integrative pain management model. And we did that very well here until we weren't allowed to anymore. And I, I don't think it has any value to go into any detail about that. But it led to a lot of anger. And when I got mad, I write. And that was why my book came out. I just looked at pain from a I got really angry and I just wrote a series of short stories, shared it with a friend and she said, you are writing for all of us, you need to publish this. So I wrote a book about public policy and pain, like what do we as human beings say we're going to do to help people in need, what do we actually do, what's the gap before, between the two, and since we're on a Lenten discussion, that's the story of the Good Samaritan and that was the basis for the entire book. And so what I did is I wrote it, never thought anything was going to happen, and all of a sudden, you know, I published a book, and now my name's known all over the world. And I, and for good reasons, you know, um, I didn't have an affair with anybody or anything like that, so <laughs> really excited. So that got me to where I am today and what we're going to talk about. This slide is not, is basically to remind you, and I've learned this over and over again, is that I deal with musculoskeletal and neurological pain. I don't deal with organ pain. I don't deal with all sorts of other pain, but it's to remind us all that pain comes in all varieties, like RSD, lumbar pain, pelvic pain, headaches, emotional pain, um, uh, and there's a lot of overlap between all these. And, and I, I think we as you know, orthopedists or whatever you want to call us kind of forget that there's other kinds of pain, um, headaches. So I'm, I've, I've published my book, my life is going really well, um, in a way, kind of, maybe. And um, 
Um, all of a sudden, out of the blue, I get a phone call from somebody who identifies themselves from the NFL Players Association, which I thought was a joke, and I was trying to figure out which one of my friends was playing a joke on me. I've been a season ticket holder for the Buffalo Bills now for almost 60 years, so I just thought somebody was playing games with me. Well, it turned out they weren't. Um, they called me up and they said that we really want you to be involved with this pain care um, program. We've identified pain care policy as a need for players. We want the best people in the country to do it. And I said, well, you're calling the wrong guy because I'm not the best, but I can do it if you want. One of the things that was really important to me was empowering patients with the ability to take care of their pain. And this, this, ar this article appeared in 1990, or this cover of Sports Illustrated appeared in 1992. It looks pretty gruesome and gross. And uh, has anybody ever seen that picture of Y.A. Tittle? On, you're in the age group that I can say this. So he's on his knee with blood coming out of his head. I mean, you know, um, it's a classic photo. But this came out in 92. And the reason why this came out was they wanted to portray what NFL players were dealing with, um, you know, the side effects of playing professional football. My big interest at that time was post-concussive syndrome. And so what, what was important about this is they carry two articles, there are two stories about Al Toon and Warren Moon for you football guys who might remember those two guys. Um, both of them were dealing with post-concussive syndrome. At that time, post-concussive syndrome in the general public was a thing called litigation neurosis. You were basically making it up, it didn't exist because there was no MRI to show that you had it. And I knew that it happened. Head injury was my big thing. I dealt with a lot of people with this, and I was really angry with how society treated people with this. So anyways, I get called to court to testify on behalf of one of my patients. And lawyers always want you to have a definitive source to explain your thoughts. So I bring a copy of Harrison's textbook of internal medicine with me, which is this thick. And I had it on my lap while I'm testifying, and so they says, do you have a definitive reference? So I start reading from what they thought was Harrison's. I get through the entire thing, and they said, oh, thank you, um, what's that, what's your reference? And I pull it up, it's the Medical Journal of Sports Illustrated, and this was Warren Moon and Altoon and my patient. And I was shocked because the response was, overnight, it changed the way this state looked at post-concussive syndrome. Overnight, with that one stupid little thing. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me the power of professional athletes to change public policy. So because of those things, I decided to get involved and I spoke up at the first meeting and the next thing I know I'm chairman of the committee. And the reason why was I had this vision of creating a consumer-based guide to evidence-based pain management for consumers, not doctors. I will tell you right now, since there's no, any doctors in the room, good. So, <laughs> the guides for doctors are all about basically, they're all slanted towards procedures and things that will allow them to make more money but not necessarily take better care of patients. And that, you can quote me on that, I don't care. Um, but it's true. And so I really wanted to do something that had a lot more meaning than that. And so I saw this as giving a platform. You may or may not have seen that movie about concussion. But anybody that wears a helmet when you ride your bike now, that's because of this movie. Um, the NFL had a huge impact in changing how we deal with head injury. After that movie came out, the NFL then um, commissioned this report. And the reason why this is important for you as non-football players is that for the first time ever, I think, somebody decided to look at life from a whole life, whole person perspective. So how many people did stupid things when you were a kid? Anybody? All right. So, um, and, and NFL, I do a lot more with retired players than I do with active players. And a lot of them are like, Jim Plunkett's a great example. Do everybody remember who he is? Yeah. So, they're, they're, I, I usually put a quote from him here. It says, chronic pain sucks. That's what he says, and it's been published and whatever. I mean, he's in agony living his life. And you always know, start to question, should I have done things differently? So what we decided to do was look at life from a whole life, whole person perspective. And what this guide was, was commissioned by the NFLPA to look at the football life from here to here and, and, and look at how does the NFL deal with players. And they ended up looking at 20 different aspects of a player's life, from their family, which is really important, to the team, which is really important, to the coaches, to the managers, to whomever, all the way to the fans. It was a really great look, but um, one of the things they said that the NFL is doing rotten is not looking at this issue of pain. 
and that's why we came about. So, you would think that if they want me to study pain in NFL players, they would give us access to players. That would make sense, right? Well, they didn't. So, I went and did it on my own. So, what we did was we found players and we interviewed them. I went down all over to Arizona, Florida, wherever, to interview them on what is pain? You know, what is pain to you? And it got, this got really fascinating. What is pain management? What strategies do you use? What strategies do you tell other people? And you find out they don't have a clue what they're doing. Um, and it's really sad. It's like, you know, pain is function. And it's function to all of you, too. If I, if I have pain but I can function fine, I don't really care about it. But the minute it starts to affect my function, then it's important. And that's what they basically said. So we threw out the term pain. We don't even use it with players. Um, what strategies do you use? They basically, they told us right out, how many of you guys trust your doctors? Is there anybody here that doesn't? I mean, you don't have to say anything. I don't care. Your doctor might watch this and you'll find out later. But a lot of the players that we, pay, uh, people we deal with, U.S. Pain Foundation, really don't trust their doctors. And then one of the players I interviewed said that. And I said, he says, not only don't I trust my team doctors, I don't trust any doctor. And this really bothered me and I asked him why. He's a 25-year-old kid on injured reserve. And he looks at me and he says, number one, he's more interested in what procedure he can do on me to make money than he is on, on what, what he's actually doing for me and what his corporate group that he works for will want him to do. That's a really long-winded, very screwy way of saying that. But that's basically what he said. So I asked him, well, what do you do? And he did everything that I would recommend to a player, and he figured it out on his own, or a person of any kind, and we're going to talk about that, too. I don't, I'm, I'm going to hold you in suspense. Um, we wanted to know who influences all these decisions that they make, and that's a really long, separate story. I developed a concept called justifiable risk. Like, if any time you want to do something, you'll go through some mental exercise to figure out if you should do it or not. And you, you, you may or may not think of the long-term ramifications. These guys don't. Like, and um, that, that's an, I could get into I don't want to go off on that one. And then the c next issue was, how do you put an adult in the room to oversee this so people make reasonable decisions and don't make big mistakes? So what we decided to do was create a guide that would empower them with the ability with, in, a, in a world where they don't trust the people making the decisions for them, that they could make their own decisions. And we hoped that that would have a ripple effect of the community as a whole, and that's why we're here today. Um, that's my son, dutifully, at his first Buffalo Bills game when he was five years old. That's my son, relatively now. We were just skiing in purgatory, and that's his broken leg. My son's a freestyle skier, and he obviously didn't have an adult in the room when they're helping him make that decision, but that's in Colorado where he lives. Um, we were just skiing in purgatory, which is heaven to me. It's a beautiful place. So. So we come down to asking players, how do you define pain? So what is pain? Um, and again, these first five elements, they all just have to develop, all are um, involved with increasing levels of dysfunction. So you know, here you injure something, it hurts a little bit, but you can perform fine. And, and, and I, I was gonna tell you a story about how players actually become able to be fine. Suddenly they go into the locker room, they get a shot of Toradol, which they should never do. They come back and play. Um, which is a really bad idea, um, which is something we're trying to stop. But anyways, um, but anyways, you know, increasing amounts of pain, um, more significantly decreasing or increasing the level of dysfunction. But this is the one that really interested me the most was psychosocial pain. So what that means is that um, you have an injury and that injury has some meaning to you. My favorite all-time example was a person from the Middle East who suffered a, you know, he had an Achilles tendon injury. It wasn't a real big deal. And I thought, well, it's not a big deal. He was devastated by it. And I found out why. The reason why was in his culture, rupturing the Achilles, or severing the Achilles tendon was a punishment from God. So he had been punished by God in his mind, and he could not deal with the level of pain he had until somebody told him that God was okay with him. So. It's really important with players and with all of you, too. Players, the biggest thing that's, in, at least at football players, I'm a triathlete, there's no camaraderie in triathlon, which isn't true, there is. But, but in, in football, um, there's a team. 
And when you're injured, you can't do your job. And when you can't do your job, you feel like you're letting somebody down. And I would talk with a player, and they're devastated by this. They're also afraid of re-injury and things like that when they come back. They're, you know, most players are bubble players, which means they're replaceable. And, and they're afraid of losing everything they've given up their life for. There's so much fear that goes into that. And I'm listening to players talk, because we have these little focus group sessions. And I realize, you know, I hear this stuff in my office every day. Guy gets hurt at work. He can't do his job. He's letting his company down, his fellow employees down, his family down, because he can't make enough money, because now he's on workers' comp. He feels like he's a failure. All these sorts of psychosocial issues. And then it became really apparent to me that this stuff was really important. Anyways, so with that as a 20 minute, or I think it was 17 minute backdrop, background, um, just to go over pain a little bit, we like to simplify pain in a couple different ways. So um, structure, we kind of got that when I showed you that picture at the beginning of all the different body types. You know, the structure could be an internal organ, it could be a tendon, a muscle, whatever. Um, then we think of the mechanism of pain. And there's, we like to think of three different mechanisms, and I'll explain this in just a second. So one is called nociceptive pain. That just means you tweak a nerve, it sends a signal. That's all it means. The second is called inflammatory pain, like in rheumatoid arthritis or something. You have inflammation that stimulates a nerve. There's really not necessarily a tissue injury per se. It's the inflammation that creates the pain. And then the third one is what we call neuropathic pain. And that's not injury to a nerve. It's your nervous system maladapting to the signal coming in and actually creating a signal gone awry, which means that the pain is no longer serving as a signal of pain injury. It's kind of like a fire that's not going out that should be. So um, that's what chronic pain is. And then time. And we think of time in three different ways. One is acute pain, which we talked a little bit about earlier. The second one I found fascinating, I never even thought about until we work with NFL players, it's called acute pain chronically. And what that means is that you're just constantly injuring yourself over and over again, but it's always acute pain. And then the third is chronic pain. Um, trying to think if I want to go over this. By the way, if you have any questions at any point, I was, just feel free to ask. Um, I kind of feel that interaction's a lot better than me just showing slides. You, you won't be able to see this. Don't, don't, I'm watching you cringe. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just describe this in 37 seconds. So when I describe pain, the process, how it goes from acute to chronic, I like to have some for a schematic. This is as much for me as it is for you, but I do use it for patients. So basically, when you injure something, like you sprain your ankle, you send a pain signal up to somewhere. It goes in your spinal cord that's called your dorsal horn, which is right here. That will then may or may not send a signal to your brain. It turns out that most signals are not transferred. We have a filter system that filters out extraneous stuff. Like when my wife yells at me, I'm really good at filtering that out. <laughs> and that's all done at my brain stem level where I have a thing called diffuse noxious inhibitory control. My wife yelling at me is noxious and so I filter her out. Um, and then you know, you have a signal that goes on to your cortex, and, and maybe. So that signal, as it's coming in, can get blocked here, blocked here, blocked here, blocked here. If it gets blocked, you never even notice it's there. And most of the time, that is what happens. But at some time, things will get, in, get through. Why that happens is very, de it depends on a lot of different factors. But it all begins here. And if you're familiar with the gate theory of pain, that's where the gate is. And a lot of things, intersect on this area to either amplify or prevent the signal from getting through. Now let's say you constantly send a signal coming into here over and over and over again and you constantly irritate that area here and here. What it can start to do is sensitize that nerve's ending, which means that it takes less to stimulate it. One of my patients referred to that as pissed off pain syndrome. Um, that's not the term we use. We use sense peripheral sensitization. If it keeps doing that to your dorsal horn and it keeps hearing all this, it can also amplify the signal here. And we call that central sensitization. Um, whether that happens or not is dependent on stuff here and stuff here. And that's where all this stuff comes in here. So m all sorts of psychosocial elements like mood, heredity, ancestry, um, even like workplace stuff, home stuff, all that can have an influence on, you know, your, that's why stress is important in pain. 
and we talk about stress pain cycles. Um, Hans Selye did stress anxiety cycles. Um, we talk about stress pain cycles. It's really important that we deal with all this stuff here. And all that will um, determine whether a pain goes away, um, is maintained, or gets amplified, which is kind of what RSD is in a nutshell. Um, and that's another long conversation. Dr. Yep. It, does that slide, it, it, without somewhat explain why there are some people who have higher pain tolerances than others? It, it may be one reason, because like, I could have a really high pain threshold in one setting, but not in another. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, I, I'm impervious to pain because I have Sicilian twin wives. So um, they're, 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 they're very vocal. And I'm Polish descent, we're not. So um, I become impervious to pain over time, but when it first started, I wasn't. That's like a really bad example, and it'll get me in trouble, but that is true. But, but there are definitely people that have hereditarily, like I have a friend that played for the New York Giants, and I think he's actually in one of these pictures. Um, th this guy had a pain threshold off the charts, and I don't know why, but he did. And, um, you know, I mean, he played with a fourth degree spondylolisthesis nose tackle in the NFL. That's just crazy, but he did, and he told me he never really bothered him that much. So, anyways. One of the, uh, this slide's a whole talk by itself. I don't want to say anything more like that, but that explains a little bit the acute to chronic pain transition and why it happens and maybe how we can adjust it. Um, this was that Joe Theismann injury. I don't know if you remember his broken leg there that you may or may not want to look at, but um, um, how many people feel pain? I always like looking at people's faces when I see that. You're experiencing some level of pain from just looking at that. Um, this is m us losing the Super Bowl to the Giants and <laughs> wide right, and that was very painful for me, and I get very, but that, that, that's where we get into the difference between nociception, which is that pain signal, coming into your brain, and then transferring over to different parts of our brain that we call the limbic system that are associated with mood and things like that, and all of a sudden that mood can elevate or maintain the pain. And, um, um, one of the most interesting drugs that's out there right now is cannabis, which you may or may not have heard of. Have you all heard of <laughs> cannabis? So um, cannabis has no effect on the pain system at all. So why should it help pain? The reason why is pretty basic. It's a dissociative drug. It's, it's a drug that creates schizophrenia by dissociating different parts of the brain from each other. So if you dissociate the emotional element of your pain, from the nociceptive element of your pain, you can feel a lot better. And they actually did study that. They looked at a bunch of people in pain, gave them cannabis, and asked them what their, what their pain levels were. They didn't change, but their function did and their quality of life did. So I'm not telling you should all go smoke pot tomorrow, but that, that it, it does have a value in that. The problem is that that dissociative effect can be a side effect too, and that can create problems. The, uh, this brings up a really important point, and this is the most important part of my book that, believe it or not, nobody's ever written about. We talk about neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means your nervous system is not an on-off switch. It's constantly changing and adapting or maladapting to whatever it's experiencing. So, but it's not just the pain or it's not the nociception that's constantly changing. It's all the, also the suffering element. So, Anybody in this room familiar with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and all her work on end-of-life care? So uh, she, she envisioned this um, adaptation to loss as a series of stages. There's five stages. And, um, and, and, and you, her book's excellent. It's really wonderful. It was really written for the end-of-life care. And I found it very helpful in applying it to loss of any kind. So when you have an injury and chronic pain, you've lost function, you've experienced real loss. And multiple loss is not just loss of function. So how do you adapt to that? And you go through a grieving process like she envisioned. The problem is that number one, it doesn't take one year. Like she said, it can take decades sometimes. And the other thing is she envisioned, I'm gonna get this, the stages wrong, but it was denial, shock, bargaining, anger is in there, bargaining, and then there's some sort of equilibrium. So um, as a doctor, like, you know, I'm smart enough to know that I think people experience grieving and we'll go through these stages. 
Um, the problem is they don't just go through it linearly, they go through it circularly and you're constant, like a patient will come in and they're doing great, and you're all excited, yay, we finally helped you adapt to your pain. And I will say pain is like psychotherapy, pain management is like psychotherapy, it's a process. You need to have continuity of care to do it successfully, I think. Um, and then the next visit, the person comes in and they're miserable because Scott Norwood was wide right and it aggravated my pain. So um, it's the most important thing to me is this, bio, this psychosocial element of pain. And this was my mentor. He's the reason I went to Rochester. His name is George Engel, who created what's called the Biopsychosocial Model of Medicine. He actually published it the year before I showed up at Rochester. But he started doing the work on it in the 1940s. But he said probably one of the most important thing about any kind of medical problem, what treatment by whom is most effective for this individual with what specific problem and under what set of circumstances. That means that your problem and 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 your problem are not the same. And I, if I ever say to you that I understand what you're going for, you can punch me because that's not true. I have no clue what you're going through. But I still can empathize, um, maybe sympathize, but I can't understand. And that, that's actually a whole episode of South Park for those that you watch South Park. I'm going to use this as an example of acute pain, how to manage acute pain, and then how to get into chronic pain. This, I use this because this was me. I was hiking out in the Belknaps, and I, you know, I, was, I like to run when I hike. So I'm going down the mountain, and I slip because a lot of leaves and stuff, and I fall. And, um, I, the fall wasn't bad, but then I saw a rock, and it was sharp, and I, it was going to hit me right here, and there's nothing I could do to stop it. And my perineal nerve sits here. So in slow motion, I'm envisioning every bad perineal neuropathy I've ever seen in my life, and this is going to be me. So I do hit the rock, and it does hit my perineal nerve, and I do get a zzz down the leg, and then I'm like, oh. So I'm starting to freak out. So what do I do to manage that? Well, the first step would have been, number one, is to not fall in the first place and not run down the mountain. Um, but prevention is, re how you do everything you do is really important to minimize your risk. And that's where that whole concept of justifiable risk comes in. But the next step that no, every, we all do, but we don't do it and we never talk about it. So we talk about body-mind therapy and pain management. We, we don't wait till you've got chronic pain to do it. You do it like right away. Take your pulse. Take a deep breath, think it through, whatever, before you do anything. And they tell you that in public speaking, too, is before you start, take a deep breath. Mind body, get your mind focused, razor sharp. That's what I was told at the State House. I have to be razor sharp. I am not a good legislative speaker, and I don't really want to be. Um, I'm not, I really want to be honest. But anyway, so, um, but then you think like holistically, just think about your settings, think about the injury, what do you do about it? And then the next thing, what do you do? Oh, bad. What does that do? It sends all sorts of non-nociceptive signals into that dorsal horn that actually block out the development of the pain signal at all, or transmitting it to your brain. Your mother taught you that when she kissed your boo-boo. I mean, I have another book I'm writing, it's called My Mother's Disciple, and there's one chapter on kissing boo-boos. Which ironically, um, that's not what that means. It means keep, keep it simple, stupid. You don't, don't, you, know, you don't need to have an MRI right away or you don't need to have surgery right away. Um, you know, don't think big, think simple first. And then the other thing that we learned a long time ago is that passivity is bad. Especially with RSD, we actually prevented RSD by getting people up and moving early after injury. In the old days, you'd be in bed for weeks, and the, the incidence of RSD skyrocketed. So what we want to do is get people up, active movement, stimulating those joints, stimulating those blood flows. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help, but be careful who you ask help for. So this is the model that we develop with the NFL players, and we ask them how they manage their pain and this is where we turn the, all the best practices guides upside down. So if you look at the best practices guides what's for pain management, the first thing they list is opioids, and the second one they list is interventional junk, and then surgery. And then, oh yeah, by the way, there's physical therapy and carbs. Yeah, they're all quacks. You don't want to go to them. So anyways, I mean, that's functionally what they're telling you. So we always focus first on physical restorative modalities. And you know that means like you know, controlled use of movement, 
um, uh, associated with um, you know some modality, ice, heat, or whatever. I was really lucky because on our committee we had a really smart physical therapist from Australia. They are the best PTs in the world, and there's a reason why is they can practice without a doctor's prescription. They, they have a lot of ability to create, which is why everybody, I mean, all my PT friends would echo this, what I just said, so I'm not saying anything on the side. If it was me, we put all this stuff here, I would put it up here, but we put it down here, and one of my friends on, the, on our committee, he would say the same thing. He would actually put it up there. Um, so mind-body therapies, which there's a whole variety of them, but it's using your, you know, just basically calm relaxation, things like that. Um, the complementary alternative means a variety of things. I'm an acupuncturist, among other things, but um, you know, um, chiropractic care, osteopathic care, you know, manual therapies that are somewhat restorative. You don't need the hard cracking stuff. There's a million different varieties of these. For anybody that's familiar with PT, we use a McKenzie model of therapy that that anybody can learn to do on their own. Um, Robin McKenzie wrote a book called. Uh, treating your own neck, treating your own back, or treating your own neck and back. Um, you know, and then, and then at some point we talk about medications and the meds that we look at, usually you want to do the ones that have the least side effects, um, and the least effect on your brain. Most of you in this room, I guess, are older. You really need to be careful with what you put in your body. You need to ask your doctor, what's the effects this is going to have on my brain, on my body? Um, psychotherapies, we talk about a thing called cognitive behavioral therapy, and if you look at, and it is effective in treating pain, more chronic than acute, but we get it way too late, you know, we really, and you can do it online now, actually, you can get a therapist to do it virtually, mostly because insurances don't give us access to it, so that's another long story. Sleep's important, nutrition's important, bad habits are important, when I talk about that, I'm meaning alcohol, um, um, smoking. Um, what's the most addictive substance in the United States right now? If anybody gets this right, I'll, I'll pass out. Sugar. What? Sugar. Who said sugar? A lot of people. Yeah, it's sugar. Sugar's the most addictive and dangerous substance in our society. Um, you know, I mean, in moderation, it's fine, but you got to be careful with it. We didn't even put anything that had to do with a needle until here. <laughs> You know, because you should do all these other things first, and a lot of these things you can do on your own. It's all about empowering. Um, as you go from acute to chronic pain, or you go from a change in the severity of pain, you're going to change the way you look at this. Like, if you come in and your leg's dangling off, I'm not going to give you Motrin. I'm going to probably give you morphine, you know, um, and, and, and that, but you have to think this through. Again, patient-centered. Um, who do you go to for help? Um, that, I, I'm sorry, I'm a spinal interventionist, and I'm not proudly, but I, I, I think what I do as value, as long as it's done for the right person in the right setting. I, I'm really concerned about an addiction to interventionalism in our country right now. Um, we're talking about a $31 trillion deficit of which healthcare makes up 20%, and I really think that we as a people need to start thinking how we spend our healthcare dollars. Why would I do a, an interventional procedure that has a 10% chance of helping somebody? That makes like no sense, unless, for some people in, in, in like, yeah, Hail Mary type situations, maybe, but the other thing is snake oil is alive and it's very well. Um, I, I like to use the example of CBD. Uh, does anybody use CBD here? And I'm not saying it's bad, but, but, <laughs> Number one, be aware that most CBD products are not regulated. Um, it was a huge mistake that the FDA chose to treat it as a supplement. It does have central side effects, um, and you get a 30 to 1 ratio of TH, uh, CBD to THC in most products. It's rare to get a, be able to get a pure product. It's too expensive to make it. I get mine from the hospital pharmacy. Yeah, I mean, you, you really, you're smart. Yeah, you really have to because you don't know what you're getting from these other places. And my, my favorite CBD example is we had a player on our, our, our committee that we kind of had to kick off because he was stoned at every, <laughs> every meeting. And he insisted he was only doing CBD, but he was doing 1,500 milligrams a day. He was getting a lot of THC. And we, we actually talked him out of doing that and actually, because he had post-concussive headaches. He felt horrible for the guy. Um, 
we talked him out of doing that and looking into other things, get your life together and then come back. He never came back, so. Mostly because he runs a CBD company and that's how he makes his money. <laughs> So I think I'm going to probably, I, I have a lot more, but I'm going to kind of close on this because I think this is the most important thing that I'm going to say the whole day. So um, I wrote a book, Needless Suffering. I wrote another book called The Missing Chapter, which is my, more important to me. It was actually the book that inspired me to write the other book, but the uh, publisher took that one out, and so I published it on its own. Um, it, it's basically making the story of the Good Samaritan germane to life today. Um, but this is another book that a couple of us are working on. It's The Art of Keeping Your Doctor Human. Um, it's just basically, and this is all it is. If you know that, you know the whole book. Um, this is the current model of the doctor-patient relationship right now. <laughs> so there's a white coat, that's a barrier. There's a computer, there's a barrier. There's a table, there's a barrier. And there's a clock, there's a barrier. All those things interact with him getting it, why is she really here, <laughs> you know? And, and I, I'm wondering if she's just doing pill counts because he's on pain medicine or something. I, I, I don't know what the point of it is, but I just love that graphic because it, it, it's what's wrong with healthcare now. I started a professorship at the University of Rochester solely to teach the biopsychosocial nature of pain care in the United States. And and um, mostly because this should never happen. I, I don't wear a white coat. We don't have a table in the room. I don't allow a laptop in the room, and there's no clock. So if you're my patient, that's why I'm always behind. Um, <laughs> I just don't think that that's fair to a patient to be staring at a clock, you know. But anyways, with that said, this is the recommendations that I have for how you interact with your doctor. Number one. Most of us pay a lot of money to see the doctor nowadays. It's not like the old days where, you know, it was a blank check and you could see whatever you want for maybe a $50 deductible. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars of deductibles with prior authorizations, with every, every decision being questioned and so on and so forth. So you have the right, <laughs> you know, because you are now a paying consumer to get what you want from that doctor. And because of that, I do recommend, if you can, I know it's hard to do this sometimes, is the doctor shop, is to look around. I think you should have the right to interview your doctor to make sure he's the right per or she's the right person. Um, before you go to the doctor, prepare for it. These doctors are being told they have 10 minutes for your visit by these people, which I think is wrong, um, but that's my opinion. Um, so let's, you know, it's like you're going on stage, you got 10 minutes. You're, you're gonna, you have to really prepare for that, like, you know, you're getting ready for a stage show. Bring notes, and I love it when patients bring notes. I have one, sorry if, if I offend any of the older folks, I have one little old lady, she's so cute. She always comes in and she's got this plasticized thing, it's about this big, that big, and it lists her entire medical history in color code. It's got her medical diagnosis, surgeries, allergies, and meds. You can stare at it in two seconds and know why, what's going on with her. You cannot do that with the electronic record. I've said this multiple times. I've gotten standing ovations twice. I would get rid of the med electronic medical record tomorrow. I, it's costly. It's totally non-functional, and it creates problems here. I would tell everybody to go see this little old lady should be a billionaire tomorrow and have her plasticize your entire record. <laughs> anyways, I mean, it was awesome. But anyways, so, um, blah, 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 blah. Be an advocate. Um, you won't remember everything I say. You know, it's a freaky situation to see a doctor. Um, bring somebody with you. I love it when husbands and wives come, especially when the, the husband's the patient. Wives are awesome. They'll sit. I have one eye on the husband, one eye on the wife. And it's so funny, they're like, oh yeah, sure, oh, come on, just tell them what you're reading. I just think it's fun. But at the same point, they'll also hear and ask the questions that you may not. And I think it's really important. Um, take notes like you're in class. This is the rest of your life we're talking about here. You want to take down information. You have the right to have all of your questions answered when you go see the doctor. And my favorite one is like we had a patient years ago, a doctor, I won't say his name, her name, could be him, her, but it wasn't him. And um, there's a physical therapist always said, when that doctor walks in the room, the first thing you need to do is get between him and the door. 
because otherwise you won't get your questions answered. Now he's actually grown up. He's so much better now. But, um, <laughs> but, but you have the right to have all that done. You're going to create a treatment program together. We talk about a doctor-patient communication model of mutual participation. There's three models. Um, activity, passivity, where I just tell you to something to do and then do it. Or no, active, yeah. No, I'm sorry, that's the comatose one. You can't do anything. Um, the second one is guidance cooperation. That's the one where I tell you to do something and you do it. I don't like that model. I mean, we used to talk about that as the standard model. The other one's when you're in coma or surgery or whatever and you really can't, you don't have any choice. But the third one is mutual participation, where you make up your training reg treatment regimen together. And, um, and I think that's the most important one. And I like it because I learned from you, because in my world, there's no answers. Evidence base is, has some value, but for the most part, we're flying by the seat of our pants, which is the way I like it, because that allows us to be creative. You know, you know, nothing against cardiologists, but a lot of that's just pretty basic. You go in, you got this symptom, you get this done, and you get that done. Algorithmic, boom, 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 boom. My world doesn't work that way. Um, and then be honest with everything. Don't lie to your doctor. It's not a good idea. Um, be honest with what you can and can't do. If they're telling you that to do something, be open and honest. Um, and then the other one that's really important is to obtain copies of all your medical records. We keep your records for seven years or something. We, at our office, we keep them for 10. But you're not required to keep them for any longer than that. And like I had a lady I took care of years ago for Lyme disease. I diagnosed her Lyme in 1990. She came back 20 years later to get a copy of the record because she has chronic Lyme, and they're gone. And I said, no, you really, because we, we, I keep record, all my medical records. The other, there's, that, that's one of the reasons for future things, but the other things, you want to know what your doctor said about you in those notes. You really want to know. And, you know, I deal with opioid policy, and I'm one of those few people, that, not few, a lot of us believe that opioids have value for some patients, and that's another hour-long discussion. But um, if they're referring to you as an addict, you need to know that, because every doctor that sees that record will see that, and you will be harmed by that, I guarantee you. Um, and the last thing is cynicism has value. I say there's three stages to learning. One is um, blind acceptance when you're in college and you think your professor knows everything. You know, you just accept it. And then you get in the real world and you find out he doesn't know anything, and then you don't trust anybody, which is where I'm at right now. And then the third stage is Kubler-Ross is some stage of equilibrium. You just accept human beings for what they are with all their limits and their values and all that. I've been doing this for 35 years. I've been sold more than a few bill of goods. I'm still waiting for toad potion to come and cure everybody's pain. I don't know if, if, you, if some of you have been around for a while, there was going to be some toad venom of some sort that was going to cure all pain. Whoops. Do you, do you anybody remember that? Well, that was like 20 years ago. I said, where's the toad venom? I'm still waiting to my pain better, you know? <laughs> Anyways, so I'm just going to probably stop. I don't know. What do you guys want to do? I have technically have 10 minutes. We could do questions. I could tell you a little bit more. Um, probably don't have more than 10 more minutes of stuff. What do you want to do? Do you have a question? The RSD. Yeah. <clears throat> I was on pain medicine for two years. And I told my wife one day, I'm going to stop taking the pain yeah. medicine for a week. I want to see if, if there's a difference. There was no difference. Yeah. I saved $50 a month <laughs> on my medication. But <clears throat> I still have the pain. Yeah. And you learn to live with it. It ain't fun. So you brought up a really good point. It's that psychosocial moving target. People fear their pain. And the whole process of pain management is helping people to adapt to that fear. And I really think that opioids have a role while you're going through that process. But at some point, right. and you've got to watch for addiction. Most people will not get addicted, but you still have to watch for it. But with neuropathic pain states like that, they, opioids don't work quite as well. I always tell my doctor, because I have a female doctor, <clears throat> I don't take any medication anymore, and I'm almost 80. Well, you are? Yeah. Wow. Who would have guessed that? So, and, and this is really not me. Oh. If anybody looks at me now, they think I'm a big druggie. 
right? That was not my first my, thought. My wife recently passed away. Oh. I kind of let myself go. I'm but sorry. My doctor, whenever I would talk with her and I'd tell her the pain I had wherever it was on my body, she'd say, you know I can, and say, stop right there. Yeah. I says, my pain medicine is I'll go home and I'll have a double shot of Jack Daniels <laughs> and then it'll be done. You know, that's a fascinating, I thought, like, the old days, I mean, it, who watches NCIS? Yeah, I think the guy's always drinking bourbon, for God's yeah. sakes. I don't know how he solves any problems, but, <laughs> but you know, that's what they used in the old days to treat pain and emotional pain and, yeah. That's right. Go ahead. This just might be a, um, an impression, but um, you, get the, you get the impression that a lot of people do experience this progression from an acute pain to a chronic pain situation. Is there a, is there, is that, is that common for a particular reason? I mean, is there, do those, does that group of people fall into a, did a category I, that's... Did I pay you to do this? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, I mean, you can go buy these ones. I think it was in the pitch for your presentation. Yeah, no, no, you actually, I, I'm just gonna, I, I didn't want you to see these, I, to go over these, but um, um, this is how entertaining we are as a culture, but um, th this was public, I, this is why I get angry when we blame Big Pharma for the opioid crisis. This is the media saying you should be on opioids, no, there should be no restrictions. This was way before Purdue Pharmaceuticals. And this is now you're supposed to say no. So the media said one thing, so who do we listen to? Yeah. I don't know. I don't, but these are all the barriers to pain medicine. I actually came up with these, and I'm going to publish them at some point. But this is all the things that are standing in our way of providing good pain care. So that was the whole focus of our discussion. Is there a way to prevent it? So well, what factors are involved in making it more likely? And then what can you do about it? Because if you understand what creates it, then maybe you can do something about it. So nerve injury is much more likely, we, we think, to, cre to lead to a chronic pain state than any other tissue in the body. But then we gotta define what that means. So you're a woman, you're not, but you're a woman, and you have a hysterectomy. Your, hist your, your hysterectomy is an organ. Your organ has nerve supply. You take that organ out, and now you've damaged how many nerves? And you get rid of the organ. Then you go to a pelvic pain clinic. You know, 40% of women in a pelvic pain clinic are women who've had a hysterectomy who had no pain as part of their hysterectomy. So think of phantom pain, leg pain. You know, there's a lot of ways we injure nerves, but that, I found that one to be the most intriguing one because nobody ever thought, well, can an internal organ create a phantom pain state? Yes, it can. Um, you have an anterior discectomy and like you have a big back operation and they take out the front of the disc and replace it with something, either bone or an artificial disc or whatever. That disc has a lot of innervation <laughs> and you've taken it out. And miraculously, six months later, your pain's back, but it's worse because you've got phantom pain. I mean, not everybody, but it makes sense to me. Um, we talk about this especially with combat vets. Um, so the incidence of chronic pain in combat vets is about 60%. How many military people do we have here? Thank you. <laughs> so you, you know what we're talking about. Um, you know, it's a rough, rough thing to do to your body. Um, we see guys come back from, you know, IED incidents, whatever, with, you know, they're just totally trashed. And they're most like, they're more likely than not. You know, they're happy to be alive, I suppose, but a lot of them, you're more likely to get chronic pain. The longer you have pain, the more likely it is to be chronic. That's why you need to be aggressive early. Uh, aggressive is a relative concept. You know, you can give it a week or two to see what you do on your own, but if you're not getting better, then you want to start to get aggressive. Of course, if you have to wait three months to see your doctor, but you can see your chiropractor over in the same day. Um, the intensity, the more severe your pain is, the more likely it's to be chronic. The setting of the injury is really important. So one of my favorite examples is workers' compensation. So they always blame the patient, right? So it's always the patient's fault. Well, that's not true. It's more complicated that. For every simple, complex social problem, there's a solution that's neat, simple, and wrong. And this is one of those examples. So Twain, Mark Twain and Mencken said that. Two, they said it separate decades. But um, probably didn't even know each other. But anyway, so um, um, what was I saying? So workers' comp. 
what we know is that the likelihood of a work-related injury becoming chronic is dependent on two factors. One, how much do you like your job? How much does your job like you? Whoops. And, um, <laughs> was that on film? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, like, if your job hates you, why would you want to go back to that? You know, and that's why we work with employers, that there's a value to be nice to your employees. You know, be, it's just the right human thing to do. But at the same point, you know, if you want somebody to recover well from an injury, treat them well while they're working there, so on and so forth. And I, th my book, I have a whole example of that. I don't need to get into that. Um, the meaning of the injury, we kind of already talked about. The intensity of the emotion that the injury um, generates. Um, your sense of control is really more important because when you feel like you're out of control, then this is out of control, then everything else is out of control. So the first thing that we want to do when we're treating pain is to give you a sense of control. Um, and that's not always easy, believe me. Ethnic backgrounds are really important. We do know that. Um, one of the things that I'm struggling to understand is um, I, I work with a lot of Native American populations. I work a lot with African American populations. Um, their worlds are different than, than ours, and I don't fully understand why because, and that's a long story, because I, I do deal with African Americans who are very successful, and I deal with some that aren't. And um, I have one really good friend that's got sickle cell anemia. and. Um, He's very, very accomplished gentleman, and I, his de way he deals with his pain is very different the way than others do, and I find that fascinating. Anyways, how supported you feel, how stigmatized you are. Um, can I tell that story and then I'll finish? Does this help? Yes. Yeah. So, um, and then how the healthcare system responds to you. This is the big issue. We we call it the. They talk about the opioid crisis. Yeah, we had a crisis. I mean, it's not what they said it was. Um, um, and I would be happy to give you another hour discussion to explain to you why it wasn't. Um, but we also have a crisis of people that were doing just fine with their pain management that now, because of public policy, cannot find a doctor to manage their pain. And, and that's the response of the healthcare system. And, and now, like, we have um, the, the uh, federal strike, Northern New England opioid, prescription opioid strike voice just invaded New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont, and that's had a chilling effect on doctors' willingness to prescribe. So great, you've just killed off a bunch of people. Uh, that's wonderful, good job. So, um, and I, you can quote me on that one too, I, if you ever see the governor or whomever. Yeah. Um, and then disparities, um, you know, we treat people very differently, you know, like, for, for reasons that aren't totally clear, like when we think of disparaged populations, we think of veterans, race, ethnicity, religion to some extent. The one that blew me away is women. Fat people, people in wheelchairs. Homeless, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like really weird. And like, how do, we, how do we fix that? You know, I mean, I don't have a solution, but that's, when I ran for office, those were all the issues that I really wanted to address because I see them in the people I work with every day. Um, anyways, th that, that, that story, um, the missing chapter, it's my experience with homeless people. So that, it was really important to me. Um, but anyways, those are the factors that are more likely to, to a, you know, if those fact, I should develop a scorecard. I never thought of that until right now. And it, you know, how many of these factors you have will probably play a role in how, you know, your likelihood to develop chronic pain. Um, I think I can stop there. I do have a question. Shoot. Do you believe in mind over matter? I'm not sure what that means because what it bothers, this is where I like to think of it, yes. Okay. <laughs> in a nutshell, yes. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I mean, I, I, can, I can use my mind yeah. to reduce my pain. Right. Okay. So, um, yes, but let me give you a, an example that, that's going to. It's a relative concept. So we've seen this example over and over and over again where, and I'm going to go back to NFL players, sorry, but um, it's the people I've been working with. Um, guy plays an entire game, no pain at all. You know, and he comes out in the locker room and now he's miserable because he broke his leg or something. This is mine. He has a focus. The minute the focus is gone, the pain's there. Um, but yes, and we, we know that people can use mind-body therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies, but 
I want to stress that in pain management, there's no universal understanding of pain and no universal solution. What works for me may not work for you. And that's why the other thing that we're working on is developing integrative models of pain care. Um, and that's another long discussion, but um, that's my big goal in life is to make integrative care the rule, not the exception, so that we can look at a variety of people that work together to provide a variety of modalities together. And believe it or not, I have two really good chiropractic friends that do that in their own practices. And, um, you know, I think I, it's, it's shameful to me that they can do it and we can't. Um, but they don't take insurance. <laughs> So dealing with special populations, so it's a barrier that needs to come down. This was, this, was the, this was actually what inspired me to write that book. Those are the bills that I wrote this year, yay, that's gonna change the planet. By the way, when these bills get passed through the Congress legislature, the world will be perfect. There'll be no more problems. So um, I, I solved them all in three months. <laughs> And that's, that's the, this is the NFL guide, that's our article, and that's me. Thanks. Thank you, um, this is a very interesting presentation. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today and to the Walker Lecture Fund for sponsoring the postdoc. Um, we hope you'll join us for the postdoc next month, Friday, April 14th, 2023. Um, Dr. Alexander Charles of Concord Dermatology will be presenting on skin cancer. And uh, on behalf of the entire Hospital Project, enjoy the weekend and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.